chapter 12. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. We shall read from verse 24. Can you see? There's only one verse there. And we will continue to chapter 13, verse 5. So we begin from verse 24 of chapter 12 and end at chapter 13, verse 5. Acts of the Apostles. And I read. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John also. Sorry. John also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them out. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. John was with them as their helper. The word of God. And let us take the gospel from St. John, again chapter 12. And we will read from verse 44 to the end of the chapter. John chapter 12, from verse 44 to the end of the chapter. Then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in, in me should stay in the darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. 
The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his commands lead to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. These are the two short scripture passages for our con consideration. And uh, it is our, whole, our, our prayer that the Lord himself will touch the hearts of each and every one of us as we go through them in this homily. And I want to begin with Jesus Christ in John chapter 12. As I read through this myself, as I always do, I try to put myself in the situation of the people who listened to him at the time. Sometimes to catch up with them to understand the way they felt and the way they reacted. And so that if there are any amends I need to make about my own stance, then I know how to go about it. And this is the impression that I get about Jesus Christ's words at this, at this point. In fact, in verse 44, which, which begins the, uh, the, the, the reading that we have just read, John chose the words, Jesus cried out. But if you look at the story, uh, you don't see any reason why Jesus should cry out at that time except to say that perhaps he was emphasizing what he had already said time and again, and that perhaps the people were not, were not getting it. If you read the end of uh, the, the, the chapter 12 of John, in fact, as it is positioned, it becomes the last public ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into this world. He did quite a lot of many signs, as John describes them. So many signs, and as we have always said, signs point to another reality, not itself. And so for Jesus, these signs were made to draw people's attention to God and to his word and to him as the Messiah that God has chosen. And if they were to get this right, if they got this right, then they, they will accept him, embrace him, and the, all the teachings or the words that he spoke, as he says here, they will accept them and then keep them, not only listen to them, but keep the words, the commands that Jesus Christ has given them because they were not his own words, as he says. He says, everything that I have told you is something that my father commanded me to say. I have spoken nothing on my own accord. Whatever I say is, is what my father says I should say. So the, uh, they are meant to be believed. But the fact is that if you don't accept the person, the messenger himself, it is very difficult to accept his message. And uh, perhaps that is one of the difficulties that the listeners of Jesus Christ at his time had. If you don't accept the messenger, you suspect him. He is not a, a true uh, messenger, or say he is not a, a true representative of the one he claims to have sent him. Then it follows that you will not take his word seriously, even though you see signs, signs that are very convincing. But still, because you don't accept him, as the one who uh, he claims to be, then whatever he says, even though you might listen and hear, but believing them becomes a trouble sometimes. And it follows that if you fail to believe, then acting on them will be, will be absent altogether. And this is the dilemma in which I've, I see the Israelites who lived in Jesus' time, uh, uh, whom he ministered amongst had. Jesus Christ has done so many signs, so many signs, convincing enough to convince anybody to accept what, whatever he claims to be. But toward the end of the public ministry, John's summary is that the people were divided. They were divided because there were some who, in spite of all the challenges, all the signs, after Jesus has done all these signs, they found it difficult to believe. And they gave a reason. Perhaps I'll have to go back a little. In verse 34 of chapter 12, they say, the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? That was their big problem. Yes, we have seen the signs that uh, uh, you perform every day. You are 
we want us to accept you as the Messiah. Somehow, the signs that you perform suggest that indeed you are the Messiah. But they had this difficulty. They say the law, our book, the scriptures, tell us that the Messiah will live forever. But for you, at every, uh, at every point in time, you continue to tell us that the Messiah will have to die. That was the big difficulty for the Israelites. Otherwise, left to the science and the, the wisdom in his preaching and that kind of thing, they would have accepted Jesus easily. But for him to claim to be the Messiah and then think about death, for them, that was a big challenge. For their understanding of the Messiah, as I have already said, excluded suffering and death. For them, the Messiah was a conquering Messiah. He comes to conquer, so he does not suffer defeat or death. But Jesus claiming to be the Messiah, and at the same time talking about death, at the same time, that was the dilemma which faced, uh, the people were faced with. And so they voice, it, they voice it out here. And as a result of that, many found it difficult to accept him as the Messiah. Not that they didn't see the signs that he performed. Not that they didn't listen to the wisdom in his preaching and all that, including the power, power messages that he gave. But still, uh, we are still not very sure because we believe that the Messiah should rather come and save us, conquer our enemies for us. And then this man, in spite of all the things that he says and does, he's still saying that he's going to die. That makes it a little difficult to accept. That was their dilemma. I've always said that when I put myself in the, in the situation, I always say that I would have behaved the same way if I were there. So many disbelieved Jesus Christ. But thank God, not everybody did not believe. Praise the Lord. Not everybody did not believe. In fact, when it comes to the latter part of chapter 12, the writer John, uh, John says that, in fact, there were many others, including some of the leaders of, of the people. They believed. So just as it is said in, in, in John's prologue in chapter 1, where he says that he came to his own, but his own received him not, but for those who believed, which means that some did not receive, but there were others who believed. They were split. Perhaps like uh, 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 every situation or age, that is always what happens. There are some who will be convinced about the preaching, the message of Jesus Christ, his claim to be the Messiah, the savior of the world. And there are others who will also look at it with double eyes and think about it differently. And so some failed to disbelieve. Uh, some disbelieved and yet some believed. That is the kind of summary that uh, John gives to the public ministry of Jesus. Before he enters Jerusalem for the Passover, this is the kind of situation that existed. And so Jesus Christ was asked to were giving us, if I should say, some concluding remarks. It is as if somebody who has been sent with a message, very credible message, and he comes and does everything possible to convey the message as accurate as the person can do. And after having done everything, people still say, we don't believe you. As it were, uh, Jesus was falling into some kind of desperation. Some kind of desperation. So he cried out. That is, that is, that is the, the source of the crying out that John puts here. He wasn't crying, as it were, uh, literally as we would understand it. But he, he, he was saying with some kind of force, ah, but is there anything left that I should have done, but, uh, but that I have not done? Or have I not spoken? I've spoken everything my father gave me to speak to these people. Yet people fail to believe. So he cried out. And his cry is all about uh, that he has come into the world, or I have come into this world as a light, so that this world which is already dark, people will not live in darkness. The truth is that if there is darkness and light appears, the natural thing is that people tend towards the light. And Jesus says, that is the mission for which I came into this world. I came into this world, this dark world, so that as light, so that when people see the light, they will move away from the darkness and come to me. But this is the situation. People are finding it difficult to come to me. They still prefer living in the darkness, even though there is a light. And Jesus was asked to wear in a kind of dilemma why people should behave the way they do. Perhaps he would have behaved the same way as uh, in our time. If he were given a message or if he were sent, just as I've, uh, uh, I've used as uh, an example, with a message, very credible message, and you do everything possible, all that you expect to be, uh, you, uh, people expect to see, you do all of them. You do all the preaching. You work all the miracles. And still the same people for whom 
to whom you were sent, say, mm, we are still not very sure. I don't know which side of this equation will you stand. What is your own conclusion about Jesus, his, the working of his, uh, those signs, his preaching and all that? What is your own conclusion? So Jesus goes on in his crying out and uh, shares a few, uh, some sort of desperation that he had. Desperation that he had as he spoke to the people. He was telling them, I have come into the world as a light, suggesting that he existed previously. To say, I have come. I existed. Yes, as we know in Christian theology, that before Abraham was, I am. And I came here. I have come here for a particular mission, to help the people in darkness, out of the darkness into which they have been plunged. And I've done everything that I should do. Every word that I spoke are the exact words that my father has commanded me to speak. And I've done all that. All the signs have made them manifest to the people. And yet, they find it difficult. So he tells them that those who hear the words that, uh, that I speak, they are not listening to me. Oh. They are listening to my father. These are the words that my father spoke. The my father says I should speak. I have left nothing out of it. Those who see me, they hear my words, but still they refuse to keep it. You are not only disobeying me, you are disobeying, disobeying the one who sent me, the one whom you claim to believe, believe just as I also believe that I came from the Father. That is how Jesus Christ poured out his heart to show the, some sort of desperation because of the people's un unwillingness to believe him in spite of the fact that he has done everything that he ought to, he ought to do and have done it. Again, I ask the question, have you sat down yourself, examined Jesus' ministry, the miracles that he did, which John refers to as signs? Have you listened to his speeches, the messages that he sent? What is your own observation? But as we are fortunate, because fortunate in the sense that from hindsight, we uh, the, the, uh, the, the claim to suffer and die is not new to us. We have come to believe because Jesus Christ lived and died, and after the death, he resurrected. So somehow, we are better placed to accept Jesus Christ and everything that he said. Because he, he rose up, uh, he was raised from the dead, and then as we, as we uh, declare every Sunday, he now sits at the right hand of God, pleading for us. With this hindsight, perhaps we are better placed now than those who heard him earlier on. Because for them, Jesus Christ was a human being, even though he has manifested signs from God, but the fact that he said he was going to die was a stumbling block for them. Indeed, it would have been for us. But thankfully, for us, he died and has been raised. And that should rather help us, also, help us even better than they. Sometimes we, uh, we, uh, we speak against those Israelites of Jesus' time, including the, the priests and all that. But perhaps if there is anybody to blame, perhaps we must blame ourselves now. Because what we have seen, most of them, were not seen by those people. We have seen all that. And Jesus Christ is still alive and is still at the right hand of God. He is still working and he's still working signs and miracles and he's still speaking to his people. So in our time, if we continue to live in unbelief, then I don't think we are doing the right thing. We must, we must, as a result of what we have seen and heard and about his resurrection and ascension, believe everything that he said and therefore accept every word that he came to preach. And accepting it does not only mean that listening to him, but it means that listening to him and obeying the commands that he gave. That is what is left with us to do. Are we, are we actually, after listening to Jesus Christ, accept him, now we accept him as savior, so to say. What do we do his messages? Do we accept them as coming from God? It's easy to say now that yes, but are we practicing them? Perhaps that is the difficulty that we have in our time. And we need his power. We need his spiritual strength. We need to be encouraged to, as it were, surrender. If we now believe him better than those who lived with him in his days, then we should find it easier to surrender our lives to him and obey every commandment that he, he, he had given. We must do that because failure to obey the commandments is saying that you are still not making use of me. I have come as a light so that people will continue to uh, live in light and not in darkness. So don't prefer, don't choose. 
to remain in darkness when there is light. Let us accept Jesus wholeheartedly and surrender our lives to him, knowing who he is now, so that we will obey every bit of his instructions and commandments, which he says did not come from me, but came from my father. My father asked me to speak the way I spoke. That is how I did them. The second passage that we read from the Acts of the Apostles also have something to, t to tell us or to reflect on. It started by saying that in spite of the challenges that the early church faced, especially the persecution that arose in Jerusalem, from the last couple of days we have talked about Acts chapter 7 where Stephen, one of the deacons, was uh, persecuted, how he was tried, how he was stoned to death, and after that, the great persecution that arose led by Mr. Saul. And then how Saul also took it upon himself, going from house to house, arresting people who claimed to be Christians, because as, as they thought, they were, Christ was an imposter, so it was wrong for anybody to believe in him, more so to raise him up above their existing traditional uh, uh, religious beliefs, to say that faith in Jesus Christ brings salvation to anybody for the people, for the chief priests, that was not account that, that th those were not to be countenanced. They were false, according to them. And so Saul made himself available to the chief priests. You are old people, you can rest. I'm a young man. I have the capacity, I have the ability. Give me authority so that I will arrest all these people. I hear they are going to Damascus so that I will chase them there and then bring them down in chains, those who proclaim the, the name of this, this imposter. And as we all know, on the way, Jesus Christ proved he wasn't an imposter. How he overpowered Saul on the way, and Paul conceded defeat, as it were, and offered himself to be used by the Lord Jesus Christ. That was good news for Christianity. Because if you were to be a Christian, and it, you were in Damascus in the day, perhaps you would have thought the same way as Anna's thought. When God, uh, the Holy Spirit told him that there is somebody by that name in a particular street in Damascus, go, I've given him some instructions about how to deal with you. The man responded, yes, I would have responded. God, are you not aware of this man? This man who has started in Jerusalem and is beating all our people, arresting people, even he was there when Stephen was stoned to death. He gave his support, approval and support to the killing of Stephen. And you say, I should go to this man who is now in difficulty to help him. Are you not sure that perhaps he's finding a way also to trap me as well? But thankfully, because it was God who was speaking, the spirit enabled Anas to respond positively, and he performed the functions that he was uh, assigned to perform. Saul gained the sight, hid himself somewhere for some time, perhaps studying more and reflecting about the kind of ministry that the Lord has given him. And then he began exercising this ministry. When he came back at last to Jerusalem, the people were also, were also suspicious. Have you heard about Saul? They say, oh, uh, they say he's now an evangelist. Oh. They say the one, the, the message he opposed and even killed people for, for those messages, he's now the proponent of that message. And people were doubting. I would have doubted as well. Is this man not deceiving us? Is he not, not finding a way to trap us so that he can arrest us also? But slowly and gradually, Paul was also not another uh, imposter. He had indeed surrendered his life to Jesus Christ and now was the chief messenger of Jesus as far as the sending of the gospel outside the Jewish, uh, the Jewish lands were, was concerned. We are told that Barnabas picked him and sent him to Antioch to help the church there. And it was this church of Antioch we read about this morning where we are told that the, it was a, a gathered church, a church that took serious interest in worshiping the church as a worshiping community. Uh, the place of worship in, in the church, or as Christians, is very important. Literally very important. Yes, we are Christians for wherever we are. If I'm in the house, I'm a Christian. If I'm at the workplace, I'm a Christian. If I'm, I'm in the market, I'm a Christian. We are Christians spread out throughout the world to practice our faith. But when we assemble together as one people to worship, miracles happen. Perhaps it is a kind of response to the uh, promise of Jesus that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, then I will be with them. When we assemble for worship, things happen that not 
uh, if I were in my house, perhaps it would not have happened. You see, God uses us as individual Christians and the gifts that he gives us. We pull, pull the resources together, spiritual gifts together, and then God uses us as a whole. And so the church, the gathered church, is a very important thing that we should not uh, look down on. Unfortunately for us in our time, uh, Mr. COVID came in. And gathering or assembling for worship became difficult, not permitted even though, even then. Thankfully, things are relaxing. It seems to me, especially for those who are listening to us uh, virtually, uh, we are b uh, beginning to feel that, oh, if, even if I don't go to the assembly and I stay here, I still get the message all right. I will agree to you to some extent, but I still have the testimony of many people who say that, yes, they are not the same. I've vis in my rounds to visit some of our older people who are immobile, you talk to them and say, oh, we listen to your sermons. We see you on YouTube and that kind of things. So we hear the message, but still it is not the same. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how you feel about it. But the fact that I want to emphasize is that assembling as a people of Christ for worship is important and very helpful for us. It was when the church at Antioch had met for worship. We are told that in the church uh, there were people with different gifts. Some of them were prophets. Some of them were the teachers of the law. They existed in the church. But you don't prophesy in your home or in your house. The teachers taught people. They had to assemble. So they didn't play with their community, their, their, their communal uh, responsibilities as far as worship is concerned. They met together. And we are told in Acts chapter 13 that the, the church at Antioch had met. They were a worshiping community. They were worshiping co uh, God and at the same time, they were fasting. It was during such a moment that God spoke uh, through his spirit that set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the task which I have assigned to them. God took, uh, told the church to do that. It wasn't a call only to Paul and Barnabas as individuals, but it was a call upon the church to send out missionaries. The message must be spread. People must, uh, uh, must, must go out to preach the message outside. And uh, even though they were praying, even though they had met as a people, even though they were worshiping, there were other aspects of their Christian life that was not being fulfilled. That is the aspect of reaching out to the rest of the world. Remember Jesus Christ gave his message to the disciples that the message of Christ must go out in an, a progressively uh, 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 expanding order. Begin with Jerusalem, the city, throughout the whole of Judea, then go out to the next, ne uh, next region, uh, Samaria, and then reach out to the rest of the world. The gospel message must go out in that expanding ma uh, manner. And how would it happen? Can we sit down here and preach the gospel message to the all peoples in the world? People will have to give up their lives. God says, he tells the church in Antioch, you are doing very well. Worship is important. In your worship setting, I have visited you. This is the message that I have for you. Set out these young men. Previously, they have been engaged in running some errands for the church. We are told that when they returned from a mission to Jerusalem, they had gathered or assembled aid for the church in Jerusalem because we are told by Agabus the prophet that there was a famine in the land at, at Jerusalem and it didn't happen in those areas. So those who had more gave to support those who they didn't have at the time. And so Paul and his other people were sending these assistants to the Christians in Jerusalem. After they have returned on one of such errands, then this word of God came to them, set out these young men so that they reach out to the rest of the world with the message. And it was a call, as I have said, a call on the church. Missionary work is not an individual work. There must always be the sending community. And sending is not just only saying that God says you should go and so bye-bye. Sending means that they had to pray and fast and lay hands on them, giving them their full support. And let me add that they, I believe they added all the material things they would have needed as well as well as even another helper. Because we read that when they reached uh, Seleucia and they had preached the message there, John was with them. So it wasn't as if that the, uh, uh, this is the, the missionary. So go, God says you should go. So 
go right away. But the church, which is the sending community, supported them spiritually as well as physically. Today, we find it difficult to support missionary work, which is something that we should do. God would send out missionaries through a particular sending community, the church, the local church. We must contribute. We must pray for. We must support them in every way possible. Some of us will have to leave the jobs that we are doing, even to follow them, to carry their Bibles and so forth and so on, even though we are not the people who have directly been sent by the Spirit. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, these are uh, examples of how the early church, how they lived their life. I've talked about the need for worship as a basis for God reaches out to us when we are together and sends out messages. We also observe that there were the variety of gifts. There were the prophets, there were the, uh, the, 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 the teachers, of, uh, teach, uh, the religious teachers who taught, and yet God wanted to add another missionaries so that the work of God can be fully accomplished. I don't know the kind of role that you play. Perhaps it's not the, the role that you play, the role that God has given you. Sometimes uh, they find it difficult to accept it. Some of us will always want to be uh, for us, I'm only uh, uh, an ordinary person. I'm only uh, a passenger. So people should carry me all through without, with, with no role to play. It does not exist in the church. Everybody in the church must contribute his or her quota towards the direction which God wants to lead the church. And by giving, whether it is ourselves or our, our, our substance, to support this kind of work. That is how the early church lived. And that is how Paul and Barnabas were sent out. After they have been prayed for, the Spirit spoke to the church, the church obeyed, Paul and Barnabas obeyed, the whole church prayed for them and assisted them and then sent them out for missionary work. If you continue to read from there, you notice how after every uh, journey that Paul and Barnabas have traveled, they came back and reported to the church because they sent them out initially. How is our church operating? We have talked about uh, worship. And I want to plead, use this opportunity to plead that, especially for those of us listening to us virtually, I'm not saying it's a very bad thing. If it is practically impossible for you to be here, fine. But if it is possible, I think that meeting together as a community to praise God is something that we must do. I've tried a couple of times to sing uh, 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 in Zoom meetings. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. By the time you finish, somebody is about start, about starting the next, uh, the next stanza. But if it is possible for us to meet at one place, let's schedule meetings, worship, and worship God meaningfully from our heart. And when we worship that way, God is always with us, and he will speak through the prophets amongst us. Not all of us are prophets, though. But there are prophets amongst us, because the Spirit gives its gifts in a diverse manner, all aimed at equipping the church for ministry. So you might be a prophet you don't even know. When we meet together, God will, through the commun communal worship, God's spirit visits us and God speaks through you. You are not the Osofo, as we would call it. You are not the bishop. But you, there is a part that the Holy Spirit gives you to play. He might, he might speak through you. I don't think that these prophets were the leaders of the people at the time. But God spoke to them and they uh, understood it as God's message to the whole church. They harnessed their resources together, spiritually and physically, and they accomplished the task for which the, the Holy Spirit spoke about. And I think we need to be learning from some of these things in our church life. Let us not just be people who come to church and go back and that is all. In what ways are, 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 is God using me? Is there any gift, special gift that I have that I'm hiding? Or perhaps... Uh, it is not being recognized. Sometimes that is the challenges that we face as a church. Recognizing others uh, gift. Sometimes because of people who will fake uh, having spiritual gifts, sometimes the church is very cautious accepting everybody who claims to have a gift. But still, that is how God works. We, cannot, we, don't, we don't have any other way to follow. So ministers, leaders of the church must open their eyes to how the spirit see, uh, wants to work in the church. The usefulness of every member of the church is here, something that we need to emphasize. Let's not be ordinary passengers, not just a, a backbencher. Nobody is a backbencher in the church of Christ. We, God uses each and every one of us. Only we sometimes are refusing 
to accept and take responsibility, or perhaps sometimes we are too lazy, or for other reasons we are not uh, owning up. Let's open up. Let's open up. Let's worship. Let's fast. God will intervene. He will speak to us. Not al always through, through the pulpit. God will not always speak to us through the pulpit. Those in the pulpit will preach to us about the teachings of the church. Go if God has any instant message, it might not come from the pulpit. But it might come from you because you will feel the edge of the spirit urging you to speak in a particular way or sharing certain views with others which can spread to engulf the whole church. Are we doing this? A challenge that I throw to myself and all of us this morning is that we must make every use of the opportunities that God gives us as a church, as a worshiping community, first and foremost. Don't stay home. Please come to church if it is possible. Let us together pray. Let us together worship God. Let us together do things together. God is with his people when they are assembled. There are these quotations that people all, 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 all always quote, that God uh, lives in the praises of his people. When we live together and we praise him and praise him and praise him, our hearts and minds, everything is focused on him. God descends into our midst. Let us avail ourselves to God. And by so doing, believe Jesus Christ whom he has sent, just as John tells us. Otherwise, we send Jesus Christ into a kind of desperation. I've done everything. I've said everything that you said I should say. But still people refuse. Incidentally, John in writing this refers to Isaiah and says that th perhaps this is why Isaiah said that the people are blind, their hearts are hard. They have been hardened so that they will not see and then believe. But should we continue to live in hard-heartedness? Should we continue, continue to, be, to be blind in this age of the Holy Spirit's operations? We must allow ourselves, our eyes to be opened to, to see the truth of God. And then our hearts so softened to accept and practice what the, uh, uh, God wants us to do. So that as a church, we will become useful to him. I leave you this day with thoughts about these things. Meditate upon them and see how you can apply these to your Christian life. Because without them, we cannot operate as individual Christians, each doing his own thing. It doesn't work. We are a church. We are a gathered church. We are a worshiping community, not worshiping individuals. We might try to do that virtually. When there are restrictions, there is nothing else that you could do. But if it is possible now for us to meet together, let us not uh, fail to avail ourselves of this opportunity. So that this morning, if the crowd were filled, that's one thing that surprised me at Sarang. Uh, uh, as early as five o'clock in the morning, an auditorium which, contain, which could occupy more than 6,000 people were filled 5 a.m. in Sarang, uh, South Korea. 5 a.m., 6,000 people gathered for worship, even if, if for a short time. Perhaps we need to pray more so that uh, we will offer ourselves perhaps as living, uh, uh, sacrifices to God for some of these things. And when they meet together there, I know that people who will be strengthened as they go back home, even though they were weak. You had challenges about family life and health life and so forth and so on. But as you live in such a community, you sing places to God. Sometimes you feel that your limbs are now free. You, are, you get healed. Let us not uh, play down on our worship uh, settings. And let us do everything we can to make our worship services lively. Lively in the sense of spiritual sense. Not just that you are happy. But that we must be in tune with God and we worship him. When we worship God in that way, he rises from his seat. I want you to thank God for this opportunity to be here this morning. Perhaps you are saying that, oh, so for thank you, today I'm here. Yes, indeed, come always, as much as it is possible. Thank God for this opportunity. And pray also for a heart that will enable you to accept Jesus and his teachings, especially for us now that even after his death, his death was a kind of stumbling block for those who live with him. For us, it shouldn't be, because he has died and has been raised. And so there are no doubts now. Let us fully offer ourselves to him. Let us pray to him that as a church, he will enliven the worship 
life of our church. Living together as God's people, praising him together, worshiping and fasting together in that setting so that he will speak through the prophets amongst us and he will give us the directions that we need to follow so that his work will be accomplished through us. And now let us commit ourselves to God for this day. Pray that even as we go out from here, his spirit will continue to protect us and also to guide us in everything that we do. That we will be out there serving as the scattered church. The authority, the power, the inspiration that you get this morning, spread it out there in your life, in your behavior at work, so that people will indeed see that you are also preaching the gospel message with your life, the way you work at the workplace, the way you interact with your customers, the way you interact with your subordinates. Ask for God's presence in your life for the whole day. And so, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together under your feet, and we thank you for your message. We pray that your spirit will continue to help us to understand fully and accept, and not only accept, to practice the things that you teach us, so that we'll be fitting in instruments in your hands in reaching out the gospel message to the rest of the world. Help us, Father. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together, let's share the grace. The grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.